Hey, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So we are here for our third season of Wine for Street, and we are up to the letter E. And today we are talking El Dorado. And I'm excited about this because, you know, it's a region that you hear about, but it's not, you know, it's not something I know very well. So I'm excited to learn more. We have a special guest here today, Kara Sather. And we're going to get to introducing her and learn all about El Dorado uh, wine, uh, AVA. And we have two, well, I have two wines. Debbie only has one. One is, co one is coming tomorrow. But um, so we're going to talk about some wines, talk about the region. But uh, in the meantime, I am your co-host, Lori. I am a WSET level two graduate, champagne specialist, UC Davis winemaking program graduate and uh, owner of Dracina Wines. And I am still not taking that test for Spanish wine scholar. One of these days I'll get around to taking that test. But my co-host, Debbie. Well, I'm, not to, I'm, I'm answering somebody, somebody in the chat, but it's not going. So but for some reason it won't. Oh, I see what my problem is. Okay, I'm Debbie Chiquindo. <laughs> I'm the Hudson Valley wine goddess. I was trying, I never mind. Um, I'm a certified specialist of wine, a wine uh, location specialist in Portland Champagne, and a wine sherry uh, specialist. I am chairman, chairwoman of the Hudson Valley Wine competition that's coming up in September that's held at the Hudson Valley Wine Festival. It's a Saturday, September 10th, the Saturday after Labor Day. And I'm partner in uh, a restaurant in North Wildwood called Trio North Wildwood, where that consumes me in July and August. And that's why we do it on Tuesdays instead of Mondays, because Tuesdays are my days off. And I'm Kara. Yeah, so my name is Kara Sather, and I am the executive director of the El Dorado Winery Association. I have been in this position for just about six years, I guess. Um, but I've been in the wine industry for probably 15 to 20 years, you know, dabbling in different areas. And I'm just, you know, thankful and for you guys bringing me on. Well, thank you. We're, we are excited to learn about El Dorado. And before we get down to that nitty gritty, we're going to get a little visit from Elmo, hopefully. No, we're not. Deb? Yeah. It's there. Videos. There we go. Your video. There we go. Oh, they changed it again. We start with A, B, C, and we go all the way to C. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y. Now I know my ABCs, next time won't you sing with me? Each ladder makes a sound, let's sound them out now. We start with ABC and we go all the way. All right, well, there we go. No echo on my end. We did all right once it got started. Yeah, <laughs> sounded good. All right. So welcome, 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 Kara. Uh, thank you for your help in organizing this, getting on it. So it's kind of a cool concept. Yes. And then the other wine that I have that Debbie will be getting tomorrow is a 2016 Zinfandel from Too Good Winery. And I'm really kind of cool to learn about there's a woman on the back. I want to know who that woman is. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> there is a woman on the back. I'll, I'll have to text them and say, who's the woman on the back of the label? <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, this Debbie and I agree that we never drink before we get together on video. So Deb, do you have your glass? I got my glass. Kara, do you have a glass? I do not have a glass. I mean, <gasps> I've got lots behind me okay. that I can help myself. <laughs> Well, I we have in our glasses Skinner, and Sweet. I'd like to raise a glass to El Dorado Wines and Slancha. Cheers. All right, and we will get into that wine in a little bit. 
But Kara, tell us a little bit about your origin story. So how did you find your way to wine? Well, I started, so I'm Canadian. And when I was 18, my brother sat me down and he says, this is like, you know, the drinking age there is 18. You're going to learn to like wine. And he sat me down and just took me through a whole bunch, mostly Napa Cab. But um, I wasn't feeling too well the next day. But that was my first real introduction to wine, besides the little teaser pours that you get at Easter or Christmas dinner that, you know, parents would give you. So, um, and I, I did develop a love for wine at that point. I actually started my career more in the marketing um, promotions field. I was in a with a financial institution in Canada and my uh, boss there was heavily into wine. So he had indicated that I should, um, you know, really explore this. And um, so, sorry for the background noise. <laughs> um, so anyway, that's how I sort of, it started. And then it morphed into, I was a stay at home mom for a number of years and then decided I really want to get into the wine industry. And I actually started with something you might be familiar with, Lori, um, wine shop at home. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Which is a fun, yeah. So that was, I mean, that was eons ago, but, um, then I, uh, you know, have just always been in wine. And then when I had been in marketing and promotions and creating a lot of events. I started at a couple wineries in El Dorado County. I was at David Gerard Vineyards for about five years and did, um, you know, pretty much the Your role here more like organizational to the, to all of the wineries there or PR or is, is it all encompassing? It, it is very all encompassing. Um, the, you know, the real goal of the, association is to market and promote the wines but the my particular role doesn't just you know lend itself to that i also you know create and manage all of the events and a lot of advocacy work as well whether it's to do with regional state um federal you know politics and and you know during covid it was just a constantly changing battle where you're trying to inform the wineries on a it seemed almost minute by minute basis where Okay, now you, you know, now you can serve wine, but you have to serve it with food. Well, now you have to be outside, but you have to be socially just like, you know, it was like, hey, what are we doing now? What are we allowed to do? What can't we do? So all of that kind of thing. Um, and then it's also turned into managing during wildfire season, which is not fun, but we experienced that very heavily last year. Uh, we had the Caldor fire that impacted, you know, virtually every winery in our region. Wow. Um, so that that was tough um but it was also being a liaison between you know our agricultural community here with the wineries with law enforcement and with cal fire you know getting permission for some of the wineries to return to their properties because you know so many were evacuated so the role is very diverse for sure <laughs> It's a good way to say it. <laughs> yes. I say it. So El Dorado means gilded one in Spanish. Uh, it refers to a place of great wealth and inordinate opportunity. How does that correlate to the region, to the area? Well, it's interesting you brought that up because gold was discovered here in El Dorado. Right. Yeah. So that's where um, you know, a lot of that can tie into. Um, when, like I said, when I was at David Gerard Vineyards, the gold was actually discovered one mile from that property. So it's, it's potentially anywhere here still in the foothills. Um, but that's, you know, what this region was originally known for. Placerville, which is our main, you know, historic little town was where, you know, all the miners sort of came and stayed and that, that became the hub of the, um, gold rush. And so where exactly is El Dorado AVA located and when, when was it formed? When did it gain its status? So El Dorado AVA was, it actually claimed the status in the eighties. I can't remember the exact time, but El Dorado was located between Sacramento and Lake Tahoe. There's highway 50 that drives up through Sacramento to Lake Tahoe. And we're right in the middle of that. Um, and we are very geographic AVA within El Dorado called Fairplay, which is also okay. has its, yeah, 
it's got its own designation as well, but it's still part of the El Dorado um, community as a whole. So. So it pretty much spans a pretty large area. It does. It does. It's very, um, very geographically spread out for sure. Is there like trails within each area or? Yeah, I mean, there's, we definitely have um, on our website, you can check out, but we have them sort of listed in the different areas so that okay. when people are planning their routes, you're not going from one region to the other and back and forth, which would make for a very long, um, complicated <laughs> driving day. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, historically, I'm just sort of bringing this back again with the how we were talking about the gold rush. El Dorado actually had more vineyards than any other region in California besides Los Angeles. Oh, pre -prohib wow. Yeah. Pre-prohibition. Pre Prohibition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's a very so, interesting. I was just listening to a podcast, um, and I'm going to forget the name of it because it was the first time I was listening to it. Um, but uh, the person is a geologist. So she's telling the story of she was getting to Santa Barbara was where she was getting to. But she was okay. talking while she's driving and she's trying to describe what's going on. And on it, they were talking about how L.A. was really the home of vineyards for California and how it had the largest amount of vineyards mm -hmm. of really any area, you know, set area. And then prohibition hit and, you know, rip them yes. up and. So, them. That leads yeah. me to which is older, you know, is El Dorado is one of the oldest, one of the older wine regions in California. Is it, it is, yeah. The oldest, or now we're talking I, about. I don't LA. know that for sure. I don't want to miss. I don't. I don't know for sure. I just know what it is. Definitely one of the oldest, and I know that um, one of sort of the founding father of the modern day El Dorado uh, wine region is Greg Boger, and on Boger property, they actually found they unearthed under some blackberry bushes when they they took. They first launched in 1972, um, so they just had their 50th anniversary. But they found some old Zin vines pre-prohibition, so from the 1800s that were on their property, yeah. and they're they're still producing fruit today. So it's really cool. That is cool. So do you think it? it so Napa was 82, right? Napa, Napa was 82, and Sassoon was 80 three i think so do you think that you did you pre no i don't think we predated them no okay i not not as an official ava you know what that's something i should know the exact date of and i don't so i'm going to make a note to find that out okay but it, it's it's been a recognized ava for a very long time oh yes it has yes okay absolutely and then the fair the fair play Yes. How, that is a sub AVA or a nestled AVA, however you want to say it. Is that relatively new or has um, that been its? I believe they got that in, it is relatively maybe 20, in the early 2000s, probably. 2000s. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so. so you're saying it, it, it's very sprawled out, but it's not heavily populated, correct? Correct. Yeah, okay. um, you know, you can see the mountains in Tahoe, you can see, so it's it's really strikingly gorgeous. Yeah. And then the other thing that's really lends itself to our region is the fact that we have, you know, the American River flowing through here, which is one of the top whitewater rafting destinations in the world. So it's just a very cool spot where you can come, you can go wine tasting, you can go whitewater rafting, you can go skiing. You can go, you know, incredible hiking. We've got the Desolation Wilderness, which is another, um, you know, famous hiking area. So there's a lot to do here. That's what we really kind of say is this is a region you come to experience, um, not just to taste wine, but to really experience all there is, the historical aspect, the active outdoor living aspect, as well as the incredible wines. Very cool. You know, we touched, Oh, go ahead, Lori. Oh, no, I, I I, think, yeah, we kind of touched about the size. Yeah, we already um, talked about the size and how, you know. Yeah. 
is, is that that's a big big area to manage. Uh, it is. It's it's a it's geographically it's um and it it is very spread out and it actually I have to laugh because we had um we have different you know passport events so people really have to plan where they're going mm -hmm. and I always send out you know customers you know survey and feedback on you know what they um what they liked about the event or any suggestions or comments and I did have one person comment once that the wineries need to be closer together. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. We'll just we'll just yeah. pick oh, them up and and yeah I said we'll work on that. <laughs> you know I, I I had your jobs somewhat in the Hudson Valley at one stage of the game and it was pretty much the same square miles and, okay. and everything. And it was yeah it you have to manage yeah. your time correctly. Yeah I mean there's definitely like you can go to our different pockets and hit a number of wineries mm -hmm. in one area, but that's also why we have an event call, coming up called Winecation, which is actually taking place um, September 17th, 18th. But it's it really gives people a chance to sort of come here, have a little vacation, but you can go to one region one day, go to another region the other day. Um, just because it is so spread out, it it becomes difficult to do more than one in a day. And now w with it being that spread out, um, the, like, what's the, the soil compositions within it are, do we, is it generally all the same or with it being that spread out, is it, you know, this pocket has limestone, this pocket has calcareous, this pocket, you know? Um, absolutely. Um, it is very much spread out. That's part of what we celebrate here is our diversity. We've got an incredible diversity of soil types and actually one of the grandfathers of Lava Cap, which is one of our um, more established wineries, did an, he was a geologist. He did an entire soil study. So anyone who really wants to dive into it, it's available. But we've <laughs> got a lot of um, you know, decomposed granite is is common here. Um, limes, there's it's just so diverse again because of the history of the region so lava cap actually does you know have um it was on an old lava cap so they've got you know that flowing into it then they've got the with so much to offer that it allows us to produce over 70 you know commercially produced varieties of wine just because we can you know and we can do it well uh, that that's amazing and even if you think about it if your lowest vineyards at 1200 you you're high altitude or kind of you know yeah yeah you know, yeah you know so you're going from weather, high altitude to really high altitude exactly what's the yeah. weather like i mean you've got you must go from you know do you go from to extremes i mean yes you get frost and does it kill the vines i mean you yes you probably, <laughs> yes and yes yes <laughs> yes um so the, you know it's interesting you asked me about the frost this year so I mean, today, right now, it's warm. It's over 100 degrees um, here today. But then we do get snow. So we have this whole wide range. And we did experience a, a late frost this year, which was challenging. And it did have an impact on you know some of the fruit. So they're not going to be able to have as an abundant uh, harvest as you know typical years. But the other thing is they're also looking at that fruit as being really concentrated. Um, so it should, the wines that do come from this year should be absolutely outstanding. They're just not, might not be as much of it because there's not as much fruit. <laughs> so walk me through like what your seasons are. Cause you're, you know, you, you have all four seasons, I'm assuming. Yes. So, so Okay, so compared to you and Hudson Valley, so we do have, I mean, right now we're in the heat of our summer and this is like the dog days of summer, mm -hmm. it's hot. Um, and um, we do at least get cooling nights still and the, um, you know, the winds or the flow, the breezes that come off the rivers help to keep the vines cool at night. So that's also very helpful. Um, then we move into, unfortunately, we don't get a lot of rainy season because we are in the California drought area. Um, but we do get some rain in the um, late fall. But we can have absolutely incredible, beautiful 70 degree, you know, 75 degree days in November. Um, 
but then we can transition quickly into December and you can have snow and ice. So we definitely go through that. And then the springtime here is just gorgeous because everything is lush and green. That's when we do see some rains and it's so breathtakingly beautiful. And then we move into the heat. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you did you did mention kind of some of the the geographical uh parameters that affect the El Dorado, like you were mentioning rivers and things like that. So hmm. like what what are the features geographically? You you said you had the Sierra foothills, right? What right. Rivers? So I mean, yeah, so if you look at the whole terroir of the region, it we really have the ability we have many, many microclimates because of, you know, so you can combine the elevation, right? Like, as we talked about going from 1500 to 300, that has an impact on the, the wine varieties and what can grow, what grows better at higher elevation. Um, it, it lends itself to a lot of canopy management when you're looking at the vineyards, because you got to make sure during these hot summer suns that the, you know, the grapes aren't getting sunburned, that type of thing. What grapes are going to do what, you know, better with a Southern exposure because we've got the hills. So we've got all these different, you know, faces that you can, you know, whether you're planting. So it, you know, all of those factors we, and the soil types. So we have the soil types, we have, you know, the cooling prevailing winds that come off of the, the rivers to keep things cool in the evenings. Um, we've got the heat of the summer, we've got the elevation. So there's a lot of factors that combine that, really allow the winemakers here to kind of have that pioneering spirit. And that's why we have, you know, this kind of like, you want to see, you can taste the world of wine right here in El Dorado, because we have, so we have, you, you've got a lot of, a lot of yes varieties. So what grows well and where, because I would assume, you know, there's certain areas that Pinotage might grow well and you know Zinfandel will grow well and yeah you know all you know, these different varieties it, it grows it's interesting you say that because each area has different pockets that can grow different varieties well so it's hard to define like oh in fair play this grows well in you know this area this goes well because within one property or vineyard they can have multiple different varieties that go well, depending upon all those other influences that we talked about. Um, but one, one definite common thread that you see is Rhone varietals. We see a lot of Grenache, Mouved. Mm -hmm. um, they do ex ex exceptionally well in this region, for sure. Um, as well as some of the, um, you know, Zinfandel and Barbera, of course, um, is also very common in this region but you know it just grenache blanc is another one that is outstanding so we do have the ability to you know depending upon the creativity and the i mean to a certain degree the risk of you know the different winemakers or, or vineyard managers or winery owners you know that's why we have this sort of plethora of wine varieties here I don't know if that really answered your question because it just. Well, it, you did, okay. you know, pretty much um, because like in this Skinner, I'm going to use uh, what we're drinking here. This right. Native it's a good grapes. time to talk about the wine, I think. Sure. Yeah, sure. There is this in this wine. There are grapes that I actually first time for me, like the Petite Bouchette, the Trissal. I mean, I actually had to look them up, <laughs> you know, <laughs> they're a first for me and. Con, con, I'm terrible at pronunciation. Carignan? Yeah. Carignan? Oh, no, not Carignan. No, no, oh. Yes, yeah, you, you know, I mean, and, and actually it says it's grown in New Jersey, California, and Washington, and Chattanooga de Pop. You know, so, I mean, these were just new grapes to me, and I thought, wow, you know, these, and they're all like, uh, the Tristau is known as the Stardo. It's, it's from France. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, just it was just really interesting. And the same thing with the Petit Pochette. It, it's from France. It's a mm -hmm. hybrid from, from France. And, you know, it's... And then you've got the Mission, which is, yeah. you know, yep. good old USA. Um, yeah, it's 
And that that's one of the things that when I was like looking around at multiple wineries, it's almost like everybody's like, we're proud of the variety. We don't want to be, we don't want to be singled out. We don't that, want to. Absolutely. If, yeah. It's, know. it's, it's interesting. That's kind of been this like undercurrent debate in the region for ever is, you know, Napa is known for Cusit exceedingly well. The why would we pigeonhole ourselves into go here for this? You know, it's it's just a much better experience for the consumer to say, you know what, go there and you're going to have a different experience at every winery you go to. You can try all these different right. wines instead of, um, you know, going and getting, you know, Pinot Noir after Pinot Noir after Pinot Noir. <laughs> it, that can be fun, but it's, it's also, um, you know, you can get a little bit of uh, palate fatigue. So it right. just makes you, you know, keep a fresh palate and you can experience all of this. So on, on uh, Skinner's tech sheet for this 2019 native red, it says an approachable blend that incorporated all of our strange legacy fruit married with varieties that are more common, but never, nevertheless, El Dorado through and through radiant and wild. That, that's no. a perfect description of our region. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Radiance and wild? Yes. I would say that. I mean, but it, there's also definitely, it, there's, I don't want it to, I mean, we talk about our pioneering spirit, but it's also a very pleasant experience. The wineries are, you know, very beautiful and well appointed, you know, I don't want to give this impression like you're going to pull up and be drinking out of the back of a pickup truck or something, you know. I've done that before. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing I against do it. that. Nothing I do it. <laughs> and so can, while we're on the on the Skinner wine, we'll just jump a little. Can, can you tell us a little bit about Skinner? Um, I'm assuming this is their their winery or their ranch. Yeah. So what's interesting with Skinner is they were originally founded, I think it's 1861. I don't want to misspeak, but- no, you, um, Yeah, I, I have that in my uh, notes. Okay. Um, so Mike and Carrie Skinner, who are the current owners of Skinner Vineyard, they were um, looking for, you know, establishing a property here. And I believe it was their son that found out that they actually had ancestors that were winemakers in the region. So oh. they they dug into that. They found that that property. They purchased some of that property, um, which their is their original on, family's property. They some of it is their original family property, but wow. where their actual but where the actual winery um, is and where that's not that's not okay. the original. But it's still just a really cool story that that's was, how they like in Skinner's California, which is now called. The town of is it Rogue? I can't read my handwriting. Mm -hmm. the town that it's it's located in now. Oh, rescue. Rescue. See, I can't read my own <laughs> handwriting. <Yeah. laughs> I told you. Uh, rescue. But it used to be called Skinner's California. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. rescue. Yeah. Yeah. Oh wow. Um, so they had some significant history in the yeah. area. Yes. If you got if you yeah. have a town that was named after you, you have some significant, yes, significant absolutely. history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if I so, if yeah. I remember from what I read, their family came from I want to say Scotland to Massachusetts. I think that's correct. Yeah, and then during the gold rush period, they they went out. To they help. were part of that. Yeah, yeah, and that's how they settled in in. But Elton but Rock. then the the modern day Skinners, um, Mike and Carrie, they didn't. They didn't know that history when they started looking into Brian. Well, okay. they, it sort of all came about when they, you know, their son found this out and then they they dug into it and and they um, actually purchased the, it was interesting. It's, it when they purchased it, it was a nursery, like landscaping nursery, okay. Okay. but it was the original Skinner distillery and winery because I think they made um, hard alcohol as well back pre-prohibition days so they actually have that property on average how many you know how many cases, cases are they, they producing? i i don't want to misspeak on that because i'm not 100 percent sure 
but they are one of the larger producers in our region. They're one of the larger producers. Yeah. Okay. So this one, it's, there's what? 1,224 case, cases. Cases? Yeah. Oh, okay. Wine. And is this, is this native red, like kind of like one of their flagships? It's like, kind of one this... of their fun wines. It's not, okay. I, um, because it's, it's a, it's unique and it's a red wine that you can serve chilled. So it's great during the summer. Um, so it's just, it's just sort of one of more of their fun wines. And like they said on the back of their kind of raiding and wild, you know, it, it's right. not what you would typically expect, but it's, it's definitely, again, just really reflects our region and that, you know, we try to do things a little bit different here, a little bit off the beaten path and, and try some different wines. And, and that's what we, you know, celebrate. It's not, it's not your typical sipping Chardonnay on a patio. You know, it's like, yes, you can definitely do that here, but you can also have the opportunity to do so much more. And, and sticking in sticking to that, do you, the majority, about how many wineries are in El Dorado? So we've got approximately 70 wineries in El Dorado. Okay. Um, a lot of them are really tiny. Okay. Yeah. That was what I was going to ask. Yeah. Like, the, are, if you had to generalize El Dorado, you know, which is horrible because they're all about the diversity. But <laughs> so like, if you had to generalize it, are we looking at more smaller family run wineries or are we looking at larger production wineries? No, it's definitely smaller family run wineries here. Um, that's one of the things that we hear from, you know, consumers that love us is that that sense of family when you come here, when you come to Eldorado, you become part of our family. Um, we're, you know, we, you, when you go to the wineries, you often will have the winemaker, you can meet the winemaker, they'll serve you the wine, you'll meet the owners. Like that's typically how a lot of them run, even the larger wineries, such as Boger or Lava Cap, it's still all family run. Okay. And, and now what would you, what would you, uh, consider the, you know, with such a large region, what would you consider that center point to be? Like if people wanted to come to El Dorado and, you know, say, all right, I'm going to start my point here because it's the center point. Where would you say they should go? Um, it's hard to say. I mean, Placerville is probably, I mean, there, there's sort of two, two main hubs, I guess you could say. As you come up 50 from Sacramento, the first place you're going to enter is El Dorado Hills. Um, there's not really any wineries right in El Dorado Hills, but that's kind of a starting point. It's got some more um, hotels or accommodations so people can, you know, and it's more modernized. Like you're, you know, it's got the beautiful architecture, the town center with the, well, all the shops and the, um, you know, the movie theaters and the restaurants, that type of thing, you know, more of an upscale. I don't want to use the term strip mall because that sounds, you know what I mean? But it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's beautiful in and of itself, but modern, beautiful, more contemporary. Um, when you head up the hill, then you get to Placerville, which is really more of the hub of El Dorado in and of itself. So it's a historical city, um, as I mentioned before, where the gold rush is. And Main Street Placerville is just one of those super charming, quaint little districts where you have the historic hotel, you have the, the little antique shops, but then you also have the, you have the clothing boutiques and the fantastic restaurants. So it's a really fun place to visit. And you can start there. We've got a few wineries on Main Street that, you know, you can start your adventure there and, and move out from that point. Okay, excellent. Now there's different um, areas that yes. encompass the whole region. Can you speak a little bit about each individual area? Sure. So we'll start with um, the Coloma Lotus region. That's where, as I mentioned, I worked at David Gerard Vineyards. That's where David Gerard Vineyards is, is located. And, and there's a you know few different wineries down there. But that's a really cool historic spot where you can go and experience what life was like back during the gold rush. They um, especially during the summer, they have historical figures dressed up, walking the little streets and 
you can try gold panning. They have a little museum. They have the remnants of some of the buildings, like there's the old jail cells that are all stone wall that you can go walk through. And I have um, to, I'm going to cut you off for one second. I think that when I was a kid, my parents took me here. They probably did. Because I remember being locked up in the jail and I remember, and somewhere in my house in New Jersey, because I, you know, I'm sure my mother hasn't thrown it away. I've got a little bag with my little gold in it. Nugget. Oh, yeah. Like, no, I didn't win. I didn't get the nugget. I got like the little dusting oh, stuff. Flakes. And like, okay. here you go. <laughs> you know, whatever. Um, but like, as you're describing it, and that's so weird, because as you're describing it, I'm like, I I've been that. here. I've been that's here. really cool. Yeah. 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 So the the actual place where it was discovered is called Sutter's Mill. And that you can go visit that. And then and again, it's got some cute little restaurants and it's a real summer kind of area because it's also on the river because that's you know, where the gold was discovered. Right. And that's the American River. So that's also where all the whitewater rafting um, is based out of. So there's a number of whitewater rafting companies down there. So that's just another aspect of El Dorado that you can experience and, and have fun. Um, so that's the Asterville area. Then as you head further east up towards um, Tahoe, you'll run into Apple Hill Camino area. Apple Hill is um, locally very popular uh, tourist attraction during, starting in about September to December really becomes Apple Hill season. Um, later on in September, but that's where you can go. I mean, there's just branches upon ranches upon farms you can get all kinds of different, you know, locally produced produce. Um, they have the most amazing apple donuts. Um, but there's yeah. all these different fun ranches and things to do and kids come in there. Then you run into the pumpkin picking season where you can all get your pumpkins. And then it morphs into the Christmas tree farm. So that whole region has all these farms and wineries, you know, spread all amongst them. So it's, it's a great place to visit as well. And then when we head back over to South County, which is where the Fair Play region is, um, there's a couple of pockets there. We have the, um, you know, the Pleasant Valley area where we've got a number of different wineries um, there that are absolutely stunningly beautiful and gorgeous. And they, they a lot of them tend to produce Rhone wines, so they're okay. fantastic. And then you move into Fair Play, which is really kind of like a little, it's. They kind of say the hidden gem of the region. They've got some outstanding wine producers in Fair Play, and that region is really growing as well and doing a fantastic job and, and has some unique properties. One of them, uh, Saluti Cellars, recently just opened up horseback riding on their property. So you can actually go get on a horse, do some trail rides, have some wine. Um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, a lot, a lot, again, a lot to experience in this region for sure. When you say it's it's an evolving area, do you see, you know, new wineries coming up, coming to play? Yes, we we do have new wineries um, coming all the time, um, and constant interest because that you know, we've got a reputation for having really high quality wines here and high quality fruit. The fruit here many wineries from Napa and Sonoma will purchase fruit from El Dorado to help add to their, their wines um, in their region because it's just really amazing quality here in, in this region. And because we have that diversity again, so they can sort of pick and choose what they'd like to uh, play with, I guess. And so go, going back to my previous question of the size of the wineries and things like that, okay. do we see a large portion of wineries that have their own vineyards or do we see more farmers that are then selling their fruit to wineries? A combination of both. A combination of both. Yes, we do have a lot of wineries that have their own estate fruit and, and make it, but then we do have a lot of vineyards that sell to local producers, as well as, you know, as I mentioned, to other regions. Okay. And so you had mentioned that Fair Play, I think that's which was when you said was an actual sub-AVA or nestled? Yeah, they have their AVA. own AVA designation. Yeah. Okay. 
do but the other areas the coloma the apple hill the pleasant valley they're not sub avas they're no just they're kind not of, they're just okay. regions within el dorado yes fair play is the only other ava designated region within el dorado so when you're looking at when i'm looking at these two wines here so the second wine is too good which i'll show here um this the the skinner says el dorado um, and this actually does say fair play. So do okay. the majority of, do the majority of the wineries in fair play they, uh, use that AVA designation or do more? Cause uh, there's a lot of wine regions that have their AVAs, but they choose to use the larger one because it's more recognizable. Right. So, you know, do I those think fair play wineries do I that? I think it's a combination. A lot of them are working really hard to bring more recognition to Fair Play. So they want Fair Play on their label. Um, and some, especially if they have a bit wider distribution, they might go with the Eldorado label because it does have maybe at this point more, you know, recognizable being that it's the larger region of the two. Full wine produced at our magnificent winery located in beautiful Fair Play, California. We invite you to visit our magnificent winery and wine taste in our beautiful 5,000 square foot wine cave. Now, I went on this website and I've got to say that wine cave is insane. Well, right? they, so let me tell you a little bit about their story. So Paul Tuga was the original owner of Tuga, but he sold it a couple of years ago to, to the Middlestat family. And um, so it's primarily run by... Um, Kayla and Tim and um, Brad is also involved. And they they have two locations. They have one on Main Street in Placerville. And then they've got this, the one you're talking about, the caves. And they are doing amazing things on that property. Um, they've really enhanced it. They've also are putting in, an, I don't know if they're in place yet, but they should be soon, um, some really cool little tiny home places where you can stay like an airbnb and they all face a pool which is on the vineyard property so you can walk up from your tiny home to a pool that's in the middle of a vineyard so oh, wow. how amazing is that that's pretty so, darn pretty darn yeah. nice so that's that's pretty incredible and and they're also revamping adding in a whole new tasting room and restaurant that will be going in on their property as well so that in and of itself is going to become its own destination with the little, yeah, you know, I think they'll have maybe the four or five of the little tiny homes um, that you can rent. And so they're doing some really cool things and their winemaker um, who makes wine or is a consulting winemaker for a few wineries in El Dorado is Marco Capelli. And he's just sort of a, a local legend when it comes to wine. He's just absolutely outstanding. All right, so th this Zinfandel, Debbie, to share. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I feel so guilty. I feel um, guilty because I've been, you know, situations have been reversed. There has been, it has been reversed. Yes, yes. Um, Debbie, Debbie has actually received California wine um, that I had not received. Oh wow! It only takes like a day to get to me, and right. it, it somehow went out of the state to get back to the state. Um, but the the Zinfandel is, um, it's kind of tough to show on the, on the camera, um, but it is a 2016 and it, it's not bricking at all, you know, so it's, it's nice. It, it has, um, more of a spice versus that white peppery that okay. is kind of a um, traditional different, sin. yeah. The, yes. Yes. Um, but it's full of the dark fruit. It's, it's it's ripe it, it's it's very well made you know okay um, yeah so That's... you said it was a 2016 mm -hmm. so was it made by the previous owners it, yes but because I believe... it's got his name on it <laughs> it's got his name but he what the individual owners are desires and the new owners are keeping the name too good they are keeping the name too good they just felt it had locally a strong following so they decided to stay with it. Yes. so i'm not gonna lie when i saw when you had sent me the email that said oh you're gonna be getting 
you know, this native red from Skinner and the Zinfandel from Too Good. Uh-huh. I was like, oh my God, that's such a cute name. Too Good. Like, too good. it's Too Good of a Winery. Too it's Too but Good. It's, it, but it's, it's his last name. name. <laughs> he was actually a veterinarian. Was he? Was he? Yes. Yeah. Doctor Too Good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like Doctor Doolittle. Yeah. Yeah. Doctor Feel Good. <laughs> Doctor Feel Good, right? Right. Doctor Too Good. I love it. Yeah. I love it. It is a very nice Zinfandel. Um, it, like I said, it has it has the spice of, of what you typically think of as Zinfandel. It has the ripe fruit. Um, it and it it's definitely in the dark fruit realm. It's just the, the white pepper and it's not only this wine, many Zinfandels, you know, I, I find Zinfandels fall into those two categories either. And it's usually depending on the processing of it, you know, how much of that new French oak does it go uh, mm-hmm. into the spice world um, or does it stay into the white pepper world depending on the the amount of oak that's in there. So for right. my palate, I'm I'm tasting more of the of that baking spice thing. Okay. So uh, I could be completely wrong, but to my palate, it's got more yes. right. of that baking spice area. So a little bit maybe more um, oak influence on it. Right. Um, but then again, it is a 2016. I don't know when he when it was bottled. So how long did it spend in the barrel? The that barrel, makes a yeah. difference also. Absolutely. You know, yeah. But it online, it that cave, there's there's barrels in the cave, obviously. There's barrels in the cave, but they also look like they had you can have like private dinners or private tastings in the cave. So yeah. it really is there's, it was beautiful. There's a few different wineries in the Fair Play region that have caves. Okay. Um if people are into caves. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That, it, that is it, pretty it really cool. caves have a certain element. It, it's kind of they cool. do, and it yeah. you know, keeps everything temperature mm-hmm. cold. Yeah, but I remember the first the first cave that I went first wine cave that I went into. It, it, it's something you remember all the mm-hmm. time. You know, it, mm-hmm. you you walk in and you're like, oh, you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, it was actually the first cave that we went into was uh, Clopegas. So not only oh. was it a cave, but they had, you know, stacked, they had beautiful artwork down there. And, you know, I, I that's just... one of the first ones I went into too. When I was talking to you at the very beginning about how my brother introduced me to wine, one of them was a Clos Pegas okay. cab. Yeah. And so when I first visited Napa, I was like, I have to go there because that was like one of the first wines that I okay. Enjoyed. And, and it, it's a beautiful winery. And when you go into that cave, it is mesmerizing, you mm-hmm. know, the artwork and the statues and everything that are in yeah, there. Yeah, it's incredible. But, yeah. But ca- caves are, you know, wine caves, the, uh, as even outside of the functionality of the wine cave, there's right. just a, a romanticism yeah. about them. Right. And, you know, to be able to have to sit down and have a dinner in it or a tasting in it is. Yeah. Funny. But um, I, it's funny because... This article, I think, was from like 2015, so years and years ago. And what it says is that one of the best things about El Dorado is that they celebrate diversity, not having a signature grape. And it's cool to know that, you know, that was 2015 or somewhere around there. And that's still Still, what's going on. There's still little disagreements amongst some of the white, but... You know, I think at this point, everyone's trying to embrace it um, because that's what we're going to do. The, the one bridal that had popped up on occasion is that people were saying we should be Syrah because no one's really owned Syrah. But oh. no, we're not going to own Syrah. But you have such <laughs> a diverse group of, you know, diverse varietals that grow there from like Pinotage. I mean, South Africa, right. where else is it grown? Things like that, that it really is a uniqueness to the area. It, it's so right. unique. And and it's so like, we we're talking about the family stuff, the friendly stuff. There's, there's really a sense of camaraderie here. The wineries really try to build each other up and not try to be like, that's my competitor. Mm-hmm. Um, instead, you know, come to this region, they all, the rising tide floats all boats and right. let's all work together and, and, and build this region, you know, harmoniously. And that's, that, that's what a lot of the wineries do. They help each other out. And it's just, it's really great to experience that. 
That's that's really nice. So we have big families, small families, big wineries, small boutique wineries, tasting rooms. We've got caves. Um, if you got gold, you what? got gold, and we got gold. gold. <laughs> so if if one was to visit the area, um, are the wineries? Do they take appointments? I mean, lots of things have changed since COVID, where you can right. just go from tasting room to tasting room or whatever. Do now, do people take appointments or if someone was coming to the area, should they map out where they want to go, make appointments, um, look at events, what kind of events that they're having, where to stay? You can do all of the above. Um, there's a few wineries that are appointment only, but a lot of them have reverted back to just come on up, you know, we will accommodate you as, you know, best as we can so they they don't really you know stick to the hard and fast you have right. to have an appointment right so appointments are of, good appointments are good but if you're walking right yeah. are they open during the winter months um yes there's a couple that aren't but most of them are open during the winter months but often only on the weekends okay some are still open you know seven days a week some are maybe okay. five days a week but all right um, so patty i'll have to come up on a weekend uh, my, somebody i know is on that is listening. Oh, okay. She's Got watching. it. So yeah, in, she's in Sacramento. In, in prime okay. season, there are, most of the wineries are open seven, seven days. days a week. Um so, yes and no. Again, they okay. switch their hours. There are some that are just, you know, three days a week, or some that are only Saturday, Sunday. Again, because you have the little small mom and pop that they have other businesses. This is their sort of side, right? You know, passion. Or you have people, this is, yeah, they're going to be open seven days a week because this is their primary going to be. Um, the first to know. Yeah, I love when we release new stuff. Well, it's, it's, we got a CDFA grant for this to develop um, kind of this movement, so to speak. And what it is, is we're going to have all the wineries, but not only wineries, like local restaurants, hotels. White water rafting company, all the different things there are to do. And you can go on and when when it's launched, it was originally going to be a mobile app, it's a web-based app now, but people will really be able to plan where they want to go, what they want to see. And if you join, it's like a $10 a month subscription kind of thing, then you get insider benefits and insider pricing. And even yeah. if you don't live locally, you'll be able to take advantage of getting wine shipped to you at, you know, or being part of a wine club or virtual events, winemaker dinners. Uh, this is all part of this really robust um, new uh, software platform really that's gonna be launched. That's really bringing the region together and providing all that information. So people will be able to drill down into what varieties they wanna taste, be able to see what events are happening. So it's, it's kind of exciting. That's phenomenal. And is that being kind of um, routed through you? through yeah, your it's, website it's, it will yes it's um it's in beta testing right now so it will be yeah eldoradowines.org you'll be able to find it there once it's up and going that sounds so, pretty good yeah that's gonna be yeah fun. and that that's pretty cool because if somebody's coming in um if they can say i want to taste this this and this and it can tell you where to go yeah. for that. Yeah. And then you can map it out as to what is the best route to, yes. to get there'll to be a mapping stuff. feature as well. So they'll be nice. able to yeah. That's really nice. Kind of like kind of like how large region. Kind of uh, like yeah. how um the only time people go or the only time I go to MapQuest is when I have to go to multiple locations. And then MapQuest has that feature where it says show me the best you can route. Add on. Yeah. Yeah. How you says, can add on. Patty says she'd be happy to be a tester for your, oh, your app. There you go. She's in Sacramento. Oh, wow. She's in Sacramento. You know, that's too bad, Patty, because we just finished up the beta testing. Oh. <laughs> oh. We were too late for you, Patty. Sorry. Um, but yeah, so thank you so much. I mean, it was El Dorado sounds amazing. And I really do think I was there. Like when you were talking, I was having flashbacks. That's but, really cool. Um, <laughs> but, but where um, can we go find out more about you, El, the El Dorado wineries? Eldoradowines.org. 
That's where you can go get all the information. And there's uh, there's links in there, right, to specific wineries. You can find the wineries that are yeah. part of the. Yep. You can go look on that and you can go, you know, Patty, you should come over to um, look at an experience winecation happening September 16th to 18th. So go onto the website, click on winecation and take a look at everything that's going on with that because that's going to be fun. Like I said, every winery on that platform when we have winecation is becoming a, a destination in and of itself. So we have one winery that's actually becoming an African safari. Um, oh, wow. Another winery where you can go and have a uh, wagon ride and taste some wines, uh, cave tours, um, bottle your own. Like it's just every winery has a really cool experience and it's, it's just going to be a really fun event. That's fantastic. And though that's September, you said 16th through 18th? Yeah, September 6th. Yeah, 17, 18. Yeah. That is phenomenal. Guys, <laughs> just you contact me when, you, when you're when you planning on coming and we'll set something up. All right. That that's perfect. Okay. Sounds awesome. good. Thank you guys thank for having you. me. All right. Thank okay. you. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.